history and um, timber frame construction. So the handout you received when arriving uh, gives a little bit of information on the career paths of the people who will be speaking tonight. Um, we have architectural historian Nancy Boone, uh, and she's also an affordable housing advocate. Uh, timber frame expert Jan Lewandowski is there. And, um, Tom Schmidt, who's an author and uh, has written the book, The uh, Presence in the Center, and he's here tonight. It's a history of the old meeting house um, that was written for our bicentennial last year. And he has extra copies. It's really very thoroughly done and very fun to read with a lot of old photographs. Um, $25, the proceeds go to the old meeting house. Um, Oh, and David Sheets. Can't forget David, <laughs> the curator of the uh, State House, and he's a preservationist, uh, preserver of all things beautiful. Um, and just a few notes: uh, there is an extra um, exit to the back of the, of the of the church, the last window in that south wall that opens as a door if for any reasons we ever would need it. And there are two bathrooms down in the parish house. Um, what else? Oh, after the preservation, will you join us for cookies and um, cider? And stay and linger for a while, talk with the speakers, your friends and neighbors. Uh, and one other thing is, oh yes, this is a free admission, but we would welcome any donations gratefully. So I hope you enjoy yourself and uh, thank you for coming. So it's a great turnout. Um, really glad to be here tonight. David asked me to do this and to put the two meeting houses that we'll be talking about tonight in the context of Vermont and New England in 20 minutes or less. So I'm here to try to do that. I'm not going to make it, I'm sure. But I hope that you'll enjoy some of the just sort of basic information about the patterns of meeting houses, particularly in Vermont, but even a little bit beyond that, uh, as much that I, as I could fit in. So, still not close enough? It's, these don't pick up much. Okay. You kind of have to eat the mic while you're talking. Eat the mic. Okay. No, I have to use my hand, but thank you. Um, so, what I want to talk about is where some of the ideas came, the architectural ideas that have found their way to be embodied in these two buildings. And, you know, ideas come about in many different ways. You can read about it. You can see other things close by that are familiar that then make you think, oh, I want to do something like that. Or maybe you, people venture farther afield and see something really special and they bring those ideas home. It's the same in, in architecture. So one of the things that um, I want to then add in is also how things uh, change over time. A lot of the meeting houses that I've included here, which is sort of a ra random sampling, most of the properties are right in that same period from about 1790 to 1830. Um, and on each of the slides that you'll see, there's a, a, a name and a, a date and a place for each of the, of the images that you'll see. The term meeting house uh, technically refers to a building like these that are originally used for both uh, religious purposes and town purposes. And Interestingly, historically, it, it, the, the term meeting house was used even more broadly than that. 
to apply also to some churches. When you look at the old records and people setting up uh, a construction project, they'll refer to it even then as the meeting house. But uh, today it's even more flexible. It seems like a lot of things are, are just grouped under that title. If they look sort of like this and they are from this period, people tend to use the term meeting house. Um, okay. Our secret signal. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the uh, old ship church in Hingham, Mass, which is the only extant example of this, what some people call a, a, a type one meeting house, where you have this sort of squarish block and under a very steeply pitched uh, hip roof, in general, there were three openings. There were some churches like this, meeting houses like this, in Vermont, but there aren't any more, and there apparently aren't even any more in New England. These are from the 17th century, originally. Uh, skipping ahead, here is something that is still in existence. This is the Rockingham Meeting House down in Rockingham, and it uh, dates to 1787 to 1802. All of these meeting houses seem to have a multi-year construction period, and oftentimes, you know, funds were raised for construction, and people paid those funds, sometimes in grain, sometimes in, in other uh, produce, they paid it over time, and the, and the construction actually happened over time. So this is uh, Vermont's example. You can see on the right a plan for the building. So this is a rectangular building. So it's moving away from that square shape. It's now rectangular, um, and it's quite bare and, and, and uh, simple. You know, a, a gable roof with a, what they call a porch on either end with a staircase inside going to the upper level. If you look at the plan on the right, you can see that the, um, the meeting house door opened in the middle of the long side, unlike what we'll see a little bit later, and the pulpit was opposite that door. So you walked in, the pulpit was straight ahead, uh, down a central aisle and pews on either side. Typically, the buildings of this era face south. This is an era, era when uh, light and heat were definitely needed because they weren't supplied by other means. So facing the sun was a, a great thing. It has uh, what you'd think of as more sort of bold Georgian details, a little bit on in the next iteration of meeting houses, we'll see a shift to federal. This uh, building, like so many others, were uh, designed, not, not so much designed, but uh, constructed to the specifications of a building committee. And as you know, committee members don't always agree in, in some important tasks like that. And this meeting house has a great story to tell. And by the way, it is open to the public as a museum. And they have great docents down there. It's worth a trip off of I-91 if you're down in southern Vermont. The story goes that there was dissension in Rockingham about where the meeting house should be placed. And construction was ready to begin. And the night before construction began, the story goes, the dissenting party, the people who did not want it at that location, moved all the building materials to the other site. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound really practical, but maybe there's some version of that in there that's the, the genesis of that story. I think I'm going to switch to my left hand, David, as the sign. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, again, the, this is still Rockingham. The, the 
pulpit is opposite the, the main entrance, and it has those characteristics that we see even in later meeting houses of the very high pulpit, a window behind where the minister would stand, and uh, symmetrical staircases going up from either side. Box pews on the floor, we see that certainly in, in both of the churches that we're looking at tonight in, in, in detail. This over the, over the pulpit was a sounding board which helped with the acoustics as the minister was speaking. We'll talk about some other ways that that's worked into architectural details as well. And the church had, or the meeting house had uh, galleries all around. So uh, as we'll see in Old West and we'll see at least one here in the old meeting house. There's a detail in the Rockingham meeting house I just wanted to point out because it shows up again in this meeting house. And that is where the ceiling is constructed to be concave in two directions. So it goes this way and it goes this way. And when we get to the, to the meeting house slide, I may ask Jan if he can uh, talk a little bit about that and whether that's a, a special feature. But in Rockingham, it comes together with an exposed gunstock post in the corner as a detail. On the right, this slide is from a paint analysis study that was conducted on the Rockingham Meeting House where they went back through all the layers of paint that existed, including in some hidden spaces that hadn't likely been changed and, and uh, stripped over time. And they concluded that the base layer of uh, paint on the Rockingham Meeting House was deep red, with the uh, ochre, based paint and it had this is, sorry, it's on, this is on the outside the outside was deep red and it was trimmed around the doorway and uh, some of the, the the windows in a cream color so not what we think of when we think of the old white meeting house you know but it it's a, the kind of thing that that kind of scientific inquiry can make some interesting results add to the knowledge about what we know about buildings from this period. So like um, so many of the places that we'll see, the original construction was partially financed by the sale of pews in the meeting house. And oftentimes you'll see a chart posted on the wall in the vestibule of a meeting house that shows who bought each pew originally, which family uh, owned it, and in general, you'd, you'd expect that the more prominent families in town were closer up to the, to the minister. Uh, the meeting house, as the sign says here, is recognized as a national historic landmark. And I don't know if, if you're familiar with that designation, but it is the cream of the crop in terms of historic buildings. Very hard to uh, achieve uh, national designation uh, only, I think there aren't even yet 20 listed in Vermont as NHLs, so this is a, a real honor. We've changed periods a little bit. So this is the Stratford Townhouse from 1799, and you can see a difference in the massing of the building and how it's treated. There's still a longitudinal gabled block, in this case with sort of a steeper pitch than we saw in Rockingham. But instead of a stair tower on the end, or what they sometimes call a porch on the end, this is now a full-fledged tower. It's attached to the gable end. There's no treatment on the gable end trying to make it look like a pediment, like a little temple, none of that. It's pretty cleanly done and multi-staged going up, in this case, to a, uh, to a spire on the top. So people think of this as being sort of transitional from that earlier type to what we'll see in a minute um, in terms of the acceptance of the, the, the more typical building that, that we, all, we all know. So this is elevated above the village green, 
common in Stratford, and that was very typical. If there was a village that had a common or expected to have a common, the church siding, the, the meeting house siding, would be logically located in that place as the important place in town. There was a lot of uh, interest generally in, the, in the, the early meeting houses to possibly place things in the center of town, the geographic center of town, when there wasn't really much of a town yet. Um, and uh, Rockingham is in the middle of nowhere, the meeting house. And some of these others are as well, where you almost get lost. Um, but you see the street sign that says Meeting House Hill, and you know that at least you're getting close. Um, so in this case, um, the inside has been changed because it is now in town use. There's no more religious use um, as there was at the beginning. The pulpit has been lowered. Um, the uh, pews have come out, and it's used more for town meetings. There's a stage at one end. It used to have, uh, I guess it still does have, a sounding board uh, there <coughs> above the stage. It's on the, uh, one of the early roads, the <coughs> Boston to Montpelier Turnpike, and that's certainly the case for some of these uh, properties. The, you know, the, particularly if, uh, for instance, a town was designated a shire town and expected to really grow, or it was at a a hub of transportation routes that came together in a particular place. And that's the case of some of the ones that we'll see. So about this time, I was saying that the other slide was a transitional type building. This is what the transition was heading towards. This new model promulgated by Charles Bullfinch, Boston-based architect, shared in uh, close, close by in this particular church in Pittsfield, Mass, in 1793. Unfortunately, it was uh, demolished uh, in the 30s. But you can see the, the seeds of the design that's going to be used again and again and again throughout Vermont and elsewhere in New England for meeting houses. There's a gabled block, as we've seen before. There's a tower, but the tower isn't just freestanding on the front of the building. The tower, it comes up, it sort of straddles the roof and a new gabled pavilion or porch that comes out in front of the main block. And that front portion has a vestibule inside, some stairs going up to the gallery if it's a, if it's a two-story building, and the tower sits on that, across that junction of the pavilion and the main block. So um, undoubtedly, this church in Pittsfield, not too far from lots of other places in southern Vermont, um, you know, had an influence on people's idea of what's the newest, greatest type of building to design for the purpose of a meeting house that expresses both the, the religious character and the, the community character of a town. Two years after this church was built in Pittsfield, Bullfinch designed the Massachusetts State House. So he was a big deal. Um, yeah. And in, in, I didn't mention the right, but you can see that again, that idea of you enter the pulpit is straight ahead down a central aisle, side aisles, in this case, not uh, box pews in this design, but these, both of these drawings are from the Historic American Building Survey. Oops, sorry, David, you can take back one, thank you. Yeah, um, so, the Bullfinch design, as it's been called, was picked up at the same time, really, virtually the same time, by Asher Benjamin, a country builder from Greenfield, Mass. And he set out to create publications that provided guidance for country builders, quote unquote, to adopt this new style, learn how to make 
the kinds of uh, constructions that are, were being made in these higher style buildings. And I wanted to just read you something. The, this is the country builder's assistant that is the name of the book, but the subtitle is containing a collection of new designs of carpentry and architecture, which will be particularly useful for country workmen in general. So this was meant to, to help the, the folks out there who were uh, coming to Vermont, who were uh, learning more um, and interested in building some of these new structures that the communities were uh, looking for. Over time, Benjamin published seven books uh, and 45 editions. So these, his books were bestsellers of the time, really. Here are some other plates from that same book. You see a, a cutaway, a section of the interior of a meeting house on the left, and he called these, he labeled these meeting house. Not a church, but a meeting house. Um, you see the raised pulpit with stairs going up on either side. In this case, the design shows curving stairs, pretty fancy. A big window behind where the, man, where the minister would uh, be, and you can see here the introduction in the plan of a coved ceiling, which we know is, is present here and other places as well. And on the right, there's a plate that depicts a fairly elaborate um, pulpit, and again, a roof detail on the lower right. And this is a, a plate from another one of Benjamin's books. This was published in 18, oh, I can't read my own writing. <coughs> Where is this building? This is, this is a plate from his second book. This isn't an actual building. It's a design that he was sharing through his writings. Um, the book offered guidance on such things as how to proportion a building, what kinds of elements would be appropriate, the number and size of glass planes that you should use, which in turn determines the size of the windows because the ga glass, plane, ga glass panes were expensive and that was pretty much how windows were specced at the time. This design introduced a spire to Benjamin's designs. I, I said that it was labeled, all of these were labeled meeting houses. The spire makes me think of a church more than a meeting house, but that's just me looking at it from, from today. So this is a, an old map which is hard to see, but the gist of it is um, that in this time period, and the, that we're talking about late 1700s, the development in Vermont was pretty much happening in southwestern Vermont, around Bennington, and up what we now would say the Route 7 corridor, and on the east side of the state, up what we now call the Route 5 corridor going up. And so those were highways for the spread of ideas as well. So here we have a church in Windsor, Old South Congregational Church from 1798, done, designed by Asher Benjamin. This is his one church actually constructed in Vermont. And unfortunately, it's undergone some uh, changes, one being that the introduction of that portico with the columns out front, which sort of masks the original design. But you can see how he took some of those ideas in his uh, pattern book designs and, and constructed them here. So you've got the multi-stage tower that starts out with a cubic base and then uh, another diminished stage above that with trim at the corners and an open uh, area above that, and then yet a, a, a fourth stage on the top, 
and a weather vane. So many of these churches did have weather vanes with various um, symbols, a lot of times a fish for Christianity. So Asher Benjamin, while he was in Windsor, uh, actually tried to start an architectural school. He advertised in the local paper in 1801, 1802. Um, there's no record that I found at all yet um, that talks about what the school offered, who came, were some of the people who we know of in the next generation of builders, were they trained here? We could, we're not really sure, um, but it's pretty exciting. But by 1803, Benjamin was gone back to Boston. Okay, not to be outdone, people in Bennington uh, constructed this magnificent church in Old Bennington, right up on Monument Avenue, if you've ever been to Old Bennington. And it was right at the uh, intersection where the road over to New York comes in. So it was like one of those perfectly placed buildings that you saw right when you arrived to town. Um, Lavius Fillmore was the architect, and he certainly followed in Benjamin's um, traditions, and he, he really was, was pretty contemporary with Benjamin. I don't think that uh, Fillmore gets quite enough credit, but he was doing some magnificent things like this church in Old Bennington with multiple stages, the open stage, um, on the top, someone told me, and I don't know if this is really true, on that lantern on the top, those uh, elliptical windows were painted with, uh, to suggest that they were windows, glass windows with mutton, so they'd be painted black on solid and then pinstriped to indicate. They are just painted, yeah. They are just painted. Someone who's looked at them closely, yes. And Stratford's painted too. Yeah. And the back wall of Stratford, the window over the wall is painted. It's not a window. Actually, Great. I should say, the window in the attic, the round window is painted. Great. So, thrifty Vermonters, glass was expensive and probably subject to, um, to wind way up there. Anyway, and then you've got that, that dome, that capping dome on the top here in, uh, in Old Bennington as well. When you, when you look at the interior, you see that same raised pulpit, which they say they don't believe has been lowered, uh, as some have been. Two steep staircases going up, the Palladian window behind a real federal, fe federal style feature, and the, the grand entry on the right there when you, when you enter the auditorium and you see that grand aisle heading up to the, to the pulpit. Again, galleries, three sides around. I mean, these churches, I'm not giving them all the attention that they deserve here because they aren't even meeting houses technically. But I wanted to bring these in just to show some of the high style examples that people were able to see not too far away um, that have influenced what they, what they think of when they want to build something in their own community. Uh, in, let's see, in 1806, so just shortly after Old Bennington, Fillmore refined his Old Bennington church idea and even made it bigger and grander in Middlebury. And here you can see the, a close-up of the tower with four stages and a spire. The tower was a telescoping frame, and I'll ask Jan to describe a little bit more about that, but the, um, just one other thing to know before talking about that is that, that Fillmore modeled this tower almost exactly on an existing building in Providence, Rhode Island. So again, borrowing ideas from other places and incorporating them into your own work. And in this case, uh, pretty much a, a literal work because the 
tower in the church in Providence also had this telescoping feature. Yeah. For the First Baptist of Providence, yeah. Can you describe what telescoping is? <coughs> in general. <laughs> Sorry. What its origins are isn't exactly known, but it's extremely common in this country. Um, and if you have a tall spire like that, or a tall steeple like that, the spire is a tall, thin, pointy part at the top. Right below that, there's two lanterns. The clock is an addition. Um, then there's be a belfry. But each stage is smaller than the, than the stage before it, each higher stage. The columns that form one of those octagons may start 12, 15 feet down inside the previous stage. At the Castlin Federated Church, the columns of the upper octagon start 32 feet down. In the first, in the, in Ithil Town's church on New Haven Green, there's 72 foot columns, eight, four of which are single sticks, four of which are combined 30 six plus footers that about 30 feet is exposed and about 40 feet goes down. It's to keep it from just being torn off by hurricanes. Let's put it this way, we hear a lot about, people are in a panic about weather right now, but believe me, it's rare that I go in a steeple. I say, well, at least a third of them have lost their upper sections, usually to big windstorms. The 38 hurricane took a lot. Um, in the 1880s and 90s, four or five Category 3 hurricanes came inland in the middle of the Atlantic States. It took down 70, 100 steeples at a time. But anyhow, the idea of telescoping is to start way down inside so that it appears to be, also, you may have a lot of bracing joining the columns down inside, but when you get, not as much on this one, but ones that have an open colonnade, there appear just to be eight columns down below, there's all sorts of cross bracing and girts trying to stiffen them somewhat. At the same time, you don't want them too stiff. If you too stiff, you might break them. So if you imagine them being telescoping, it can rock a little bit. So that's, and yeah, it's extremely common. Yet at the same time, sometimes people do want an open stage. They don't want anything coming down through it. And they'll tack something onto the top of that and use various methods to make it work. Anyhow, I don't need to take you too much time. No, thanks, Jan. Thanks very much. <clears throat> um. So this is East, East Poultney, again, an example of this new design where the tower straddles that front pavilion and the main roof. And in this case, there is an open stage in the tower, like Jan was just talking about. Lots of federal detail, um, urns around the balustrade, um, sort of a concave top at the top, of, topped by a weather vane, of course. <laughs> and that brings us to East Montpelier. <laughs> I see we have a Mo East Montpelier crowd here tonight. Um, okay, great. Um, so this example here in East Montpelier is at reduced scale from obviously from what we've seen before. Reduced scale, um, still the elements are there, the, that pavilion coming off, the tower that, that straddles both the main block and the pavilion, the tower that goes up and stops with a little cap on the top, um, but only two doors. This is a smaller scale and, and it seems to me that that's probably the reason why there are two doors. A lot of these have three doors, um, but you're, you, you don't have enough room here for, for three doors. You have enough room for two doors, which then is echoed on the inside. Okay. Close up of the, of the 
uh, top of the tower on the right. On the inside, um, interestingly, we see um, not a center aisle going down the middle of the interior, but two side aisles going down. So that's a little bit different than some of the plans in Benjamin and some of the other buildings that we just looked at. The when you come in, you get seen by everybody if you're late. Yes, yes you do. <laughs> yes, I'm glad you were all on time. <laughs> Um, so the ceiling here, as we've alluded to a couple times, is coved, and it's coved in two directions. The little inset here on the right is the Rockingham example, and you really can't see the picture on the right, so I'm going to suggest that before you leave tonight, you go to the back corners, uh, since we're actually in the building itself, forget the picture, go and take a look, just look up at it and say, oh yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, remarkable. And I. I beforehand uh, tonight was asking Jan what he thought of the complexity of this. Are you free to come back? If it's if it's special, we want to know it. Well, in truth, I, I was up there with uh, Tom Schmidt last week, but I didn't look at how they framed that cove. But it's like, it's a complicated piece of work on a big scale. But truth is, if you're bringing two large cove moldings together. You're going to have the same situation. You're either cope them, or you're going to mire them. My guess is, if you look at the cove ceiling everywhere along here, it's made out of wide boards that have been cut to a curve generally. I only know of one church that has naturally curved coving, as in um, Esperance, New York. But um, it's an Episcopal is there church. Which town in New York? Pardon me? Which town in New York? Esperance. Actually, it's right before Esperance on Route 20. But um, it's an Episcopal church. And that has actually not a cove ceiling, but as a Nancy showed in Bennington, and they also have Middlebury, a dome in the middle of the main room. It was called a globe arch. And you have to actually frame the church rather elaborately to do that. But here you have large, wide boards cut to a curve. And if you want to make it even more of a cove, you'll line boards up one after the other and double them, cut, just cutting flat boards to a curve. At the corner where they come together, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to calculate the, a reverse hip, you might say, and probably have two boards, both with bevels cut on them, to take the plaster laugh that comes in. And um, I just have to make a point of going up and seeing it one of these days. Okay. Thanks, Jan. Um, the idea is that uh, the coved ceilings helped with acoustics. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's something, again, that, that we saw in Rockingham, and we see it here. It's, it's not a typical feature. It's a special feature. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit behind here on my, there we go. So the, um, <clears throat> the pulpit here, which you can see behind the screen, or you can't see behind the screen, um, follows that same model of being elevated, being approached by symmetrical stairs on either side. What you can't see behind here is that the portion of the uh, pulpit where the minister stands is actually uh, projected out a little bit over a curved area underneath, quite graceful. So another instance of curve in the building here, as well as the gallery behind and above the pulpit. Sorry, I pushed a wrong button here and I got totally out of order. <laughs> If you could bear with me for a second, catch up.
The next one, David? I know my answer. It's not going? No. Hang on. Okay. Now I'm having technical <laughs> difficulties. Well, I can sort of talk it through as well while we're, while we're waiting. Ah. But it's, it's, there we go. No, nope, not yet. No, nope, it didn't. So another thing that is quite remarkable and notable here is the use of wide boards in the box pews where you're sitting. The, the chair, the, the lower bottom and the backs are these magnificent wide boards. Speaking in 1940 or so, the architectural historian Herbert Wheaton Congdon noted about this meeting house, the paneling of pews and wainscot of immensely wide is still innocent of paint <laughs> and has aged to a warm brown. So I think that that's pretty common in what we've seen in other meeting houses with box pews is that they weren't painted. And if you were ever wondering, I mean, there again, there's a whole paint analysis industry that looks at uh, trying to figure out what the original surface uh, finish was on things. Still having a trouble, huh, David? Yeah, something has frozen up. Okay. Sorry. Well, we're paused. Can I ask? It, yeah. Is that what is that railed area down? Here, like the gated kind of railing around. So um, that's in in a sense that's a religious question, a religious <laughs> use question. Um, and Tom, is that something that you'd rather yeah. describe? Uh, no, I'll just wait. Okay. Okay. Is there a tech wizard in <laughs> Our, uh, the laptop was frozen, and I'm not sure. Does anyone have any suggestions? Hit, hit um, that return that round arrow at the top. the beautiful warm brown unpainted innocent trim innocent. innocent now turning our attention to the old west church which was built remarkably close in time to this one um, i think we'll we understand that lovell kelton who framed the first one here, then went on to frame Old West in the next year. He's a busy guy. But this, this meeting house is quite different from the one here. For one thing, it's taller. The proportions are different. It's, it has two full stories with the galleries up above going around three sides. It has a tower, but it's not projecting out. There's no vestibule necessarily sticking off the front, the vestibule is inside, and we'll talk in a few minutes about sort of how that may or may not have come to be. The front doors are echoed on the, the three front doors on the front are echoed with doors inside the vestibule and echoed again in the layout of the box, box pews inside the center aisle and the two side aisles. As many of you may know, the back of Old West is painted red. And according to David Sheets, it has always been painted red. And uh, I, I think the clapboards are new, right? I took a close look at them the other day. Was it, was it re recited? No? 
<laughs> Anybody know? Yeah, it it's uh, summer and noon, summer. Summer and noon. The newest, and there was some of the sides that made the original. Okay. Um, so, again, you know, back to um, the, the uh, Rockingham Meeting House being painted entirely red. So, the ingredients that went into red paint were cheaper than in the ingredients that went into white paint. So it may again be a you know, thrifty, Yankee kind of approach. And here, a typical window of, um, again, these, these small panes that were very expensive. Instead of Palladium. <laughs> um, a multi-stage tower and on this one I don't know if, if the lantern at the top is painted or not. Does anybody know? Painted. Painted. Okay. Um, on the right below the bell tower is an area uh, above the vestibule where the, the rope hangs down for ringing the bell. I'd say in, in all of the, the meeting houses that I looked like, the bell always came later on these small rural uh, areas. A lot of times it was you know, a separate subscription that raised the money, or maybe it was someone who had made some money, uh, who, who favored the town and, and donated the money for a bell. A view from the inside, a view of the pulpit. Now, the, um, my understanding is that the pulpit here was lowered at one point, and that was typical for a lot of these meeting houses. People, I don't know, maybe felt intimidated by having this, you know, someone looking down from quite that high, looking down on you. Um, not a terribly friendly, friendly kind of perspective. Um, yeah. In the, here we see paint just on the edges of the, uh, the the trim of the box pews, which I think was was done later. But I don't know that there hasn't been a paint analysis to know if, you know how deep that that blue paint went. The uh, the color used inside Old West is sort of a pale blue, whereas here it's a pale green. Down in Rockingham, it was a pale greenish yellow that they found uh, covering certain parts of the inside. Okay. Now, here's just something that is more of a, of a lingering question than uh, a statement of fact. So this one more, please. This uh, excerpt is from Abby Hemingway's uh, historical, Vermont Historical Gazetteer. And if you sort of zero in on it, there's a section that talks about Lovell Kelton raising it. And it says, as first framed, there was a projection in front supporting the steeple, but subsequently, the corners were filled out, leaving the building in its present shape. And that the, the, the tradition has always been to assume that that meant that originally it had a tower sticking out the front, like uh, the Stratford Meeting House, that freestanding tower, and that at some point after the whole thing was done, there was an effort to fill in those areas to either side of the tower and make it a plain front. But when I was looking at this, I was then reading the next line, which says, subsequently, so this is talking about, you know, there's a, he's talking about as first framed, it's, it's such and such. And then it says, during the next two summers, 1824 and 5, the house was completed under the direction 
of Mr. Griffin of Hardwick. So after it was first framed, if you look at the church records, which are at the Vermont Historical Society, they were still talking about that tower in 1824 and looking at approving the tower before the building was completed. So, I mean, that's one interpretation of it. As I said, this is you know, sort of leading to a question about when was that tower enclosed to create the, the next, um, the shape of the building. Old West had what many meeting houses had out back, namely these long carriage sheds, horse sheds, where people who came to services at the meeting house that may have been uh, you know, all day long or twice a day, they had a place to put their horse, their carriage, uh, out, of, out of the weather. Here's an example of a church that went through that change that I was just describing as a possibility for Old West. It's in Amherst, New Hampshire, which sort of just coincidentally was the childhood home of Rebecca Peabody, who married Parley Davis. Parley Davis and connected with here. But if you look at the, the top image on the right, you see the uh, freestanding tower projecting from the front. And then what happened was they filled in the corners to create a solid gabled block. So did that happen in, at Old West? In any, uh, did it happen before the thing was finished? Did it happen after the thing was finished? Not sure, we don't know. Okay. This is the uh, meeting house in Mont Vernon, New Hampshire, where again, Mont Vernon was part of Amherst, New Hampshire, where Rebecca was from. And this uh, came out in recent research here in um, East Montpelier about was there any design precedent in Rebecca's hometown that she carried here and had influence and, and input into the design here. But as you can see, the building here, which has been raised level, raised, uh, there's a, a floor that was built in underneath. So if you look at the front, next, you have to imagine cutting it off horizontally to get a sense of the massing of this building here. And the doors in the front have been totally changed. But that uh, tower and the front, multi-stage going up to the dome cap and the weather vane, is very much familiar to what we've seen elsewhere and what we've seen here. On the left is a picture that Tom was able to uh, get about th what the interior of that building in Mont Vernon had looked like before it was totally changed and modernized. And so it's a little bit hard to tell, but on the left, you see the example of the high pulpit with the stairs ascending on either side steeply. Okay. And I may, uh, I may finish at this point because I know we want to get to Jan, um, but I'll just talk a little bit again about something that's relevant to East Montpelier. So this is South Walden not too far away, um, built around the same time, 1825. It has been changed on the inside, but the original building here was documented to have been based on a meeting house that had been constructed in, in Danville, Vermont, in 1822 on the Danville Green. And in that meeting house, it was said that the design was very similar to this, 
where you entered at the pulpit end and um, had just a single, a single gallery over the minister's pulpit. Danville at the time was a shire town, so a big deal in this general area, in this region. And the, the, uh, the interpretation goes that the Danville meeting house influenced a whole slew of meeting houses that were built shortly thereafter in the area. Probably through the <coughs> circuit riding preachers who traveled around and who you know, would know what a meeting house looks like. So again, that's something where you, know, you, you sort of follow the, the trail a little bit and there isn't any hard evidence. There's no particular image existing of that 1822 building to, to check it out, but there is that physical description of what it was like. So I am going to now switch over to uh, let Jan come up because he has some really interesting things to talk about. Um, because we know something about Lovell Kelvin because he had diaries. And then there's a very interesting article written by a guy named Michael Cuba who did a lot of study on that church up there. Most people don't see it though because it got published in a journal that most people don't get called Timber Framing. But, um, Spent a long time on that. Who did the beautiful interior work in these churches? There's mention of this guy from Hardwick. There's a mention of someone here. But we know Kelvin was probably just framing. He was a very good framer. 200 years later, these churches are great. That is, they're, my guess is they pick the sites well. They're not very crooked. They're on stone foundations. They aren't in trouble. They're not rotten underneath. I don't actually I don't know about this one. Um, Old West Church is, is beautiful underneath. It's round, round joists, some of them with the bark on. They're perfectly good. Whereas if you go over to the lake in North Callis, that other building there was fantastically rotten. And uh, <laughs> no, it's, no, it's, 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 it's hard to judge what causes a building to do well. Kellen picked good things. He wasn't good at one thing, though, trussing. I'll get into that after a while. But let's, okay, here we've got the Old West and the meeting house here in the center. Well, I was called, in, I've been to the Old West many times, but when I was called there in, I think, 2017, they wanted to do some work on the steeple because we're talking about telescoping. One of the great things about telescoping is it allows you to do your work on the ground. By the way, some of them weren't telescoped. Some of them were built on the ground and lifted by Derek. The Stowe Congregational, 165 feet, um, was built where the Stratford store is finished in every way, weather vane on it, metal on it. Brought a guy named Edgerton up from Charlotte with one horse and a lot of rope. You got a, this is in the newspaper over, you can read it in the news, old news and citizens in the 1860s. Put a hundred foot tree up on the church, picked it up and put it in. But a great many others, Stratford, um, South Woodstock, I know for sure. I, I know loads of others for sure. There's a long description of Ethel Towns Church in the New Haven Green coming up and emerging in two hours out of itself, out of the, you have to build about 80 feet first, or 100 feet. Then you build within it, use that as scaffolding. Then you put block and tack with the four corners, start pulling on them and you'll lift this object up and throw some timber underneath it and you're done. Now, a great advantage, you don't have to, you're not, you're not working at 130 feet so that when you drop your pencil, you have to go down 130 feet to get it. You're working more or less on the ground. You're working in the building, possibly. However, it has one bad thing. I've done this a number of times. You work for a couple months, and then in two hours, it all comes to fruition, or it doesn't come to fruition. <laughs> what if it doesn't fit? Well, something happened at the Old West Church. That's why I was called there. Go up in the tower, and the, the upper octagon, which comes down... To near the bottom of the lower octagon, the columns sit on blocks of wood. Some of them composed of cut-off column. Something happened. It didn't, they, they brought it up and they couldn't get the timbers, is my guess, that they wanted to bed it, they wanted to make it bare on in there. So they started doing other things. And up with this telescope, and you can do other things because you've got the next skirting roof up there 
actually binding it in. So anyhow, but they had this problem. It had been leaking too, so there was rot down there on some of them. But um, I think people were mostly appalled by this little collection of blocks that everything was sitting on. So Lovell Kelton neither had a bad day or he didn't tell anybody. It's been, they're up in the tower. Nobody can see them. Everything's finished. They're going, they're going WTF is what they're saying. And, uh, you know, what are we going to do? And they start cutting things off and sticking things under things. And they tell everybody it's great. And it is great. So anyhow, we, do, we, we decided, we, but, some, but the roof has been leaking up top. It's one of the problems with church steeples is if there's a problem down here, someone will do something about it. If there's a leak going on up in the church steeple, not until it starts leaking all the way down and leaking into the vestibule does anyone even go up and look. Sometimes it's very difficult to go up and look. They're, they're tight. They're constrained. I oftentimes tell people, I work on steeples probably more than anything else. I tell people that I could do anything up there because the owners, the engineer, labor industry, they won't go up there. Sometimes they'll come to the open deck and say, that's far enough. And uh, no one wants to crawl. You know, you've got cobwebs in your face. There's bats, which you have to like. There's uh, tons of, you know, maybe a foot of flies. Three feet of bird poop, you know, are open there. So no one goes up there, but they get in trouble anyhow. So we pulled the upper octagon off with a large crane. Also, the mast on top was shot. I think the vein was down by that time. And... Um, Oh, I didn't, I didn't mean that, Tom. I mean, David. You can, I didn't mean to. Okay. Yeah, that, that's fine right there. Okay. We, we, we brought that off the church and put it on a base on the ground. And what I try to do is build a base on the ground that mimics the one upstairs exactly so I can't get in trouble, I think. But there's nothing to mimic up there because there was no base. There are piles of wooden blocks. Um, anyhow, we brought it down. And we start taking it apart in order to change. A lot of the plate up top is rotten. The roofing needed to be changed. And there are rotten columns down below. Um, I'm seeing that. Can you go back one at all? Yeah. Hmm. No, go. Oh, God only knows what order these things are in. Sure. I'm sure it's my problem. But now, anyhow. How about that? In 2018. This octagon had a straight cap on it. It was, it was an octagonal, but with straight rafters. I figured, well, that's unusual. Most of them have an OG curve, or a, what they call a bell cast curve, but you know, nothing stopping people from doing what they want to do. We start pulling the roof apart, there are the OG rafters down in there. That was, it's, it's rare that you get to get a good discovery like this. You know, it's a great thing. And um, so we just, and, the, and the, the straight rafters were just little things that were hammered on with wire nails. When they had a fire or when it got rotten at some point in time, or I think what Tom called the dark ages, when, you, when people, churches lose their, well, they don't lose, they don't have hardly any people going to them now. But most churches I work in have seven, 12, three, 15 members of the congregation trying to, trying to keep a very expensive building intact. Anyhow, someone did a budget job on the roof and we opened it up, found the OG rafters, and um, the church committee was great. They said, oh yeah, if you can actually get the actual curve, do it. So go ahead. Um, actually, there is one of the OG rafters. You can see it coming down. See, see how it's shaped? You see the, the curve that starts right above the cornice there? And it goes up and goes to another one. Yeah, those are the, all the OG rafters there. And uh, which had that nice curve to them. There was actually plenty left. And um, go one more. Yeah, you can see them again. Go one more. I'm about to see. That's that was, I thought was the first one. But that's that's where we before. That's where we're getting ready to pull it off. Um, David, try and go another one. I want to go to those ones when I've got the new ones laying on the ground. There. Okay. We had some parts broken off. Some of them. So what we do in that case is you take a very thin piece of very straight grain wood and you lay it on and you force it to the curve and it'll make a nice curve. And then you copy it and you get those. I went to PNR Lumber, got a bunch of three by, three by 15 pine plank. If you need a large plank to do this, cut them, put them together into a collection of OG rafters, then put them up there 
and uh, got a very clever guy who does lead coated copper work for us to roof it. We also replaced the, uh, this wooden spike that comes out the middle, which this one has two, Walden has two, and um, well, I say the Old West Church has two, and put the weather vane, put a weather vane back on top. Um, and these veins, I don't know if you noticed in Nancy's picture, Walden actually has a, a realistic fish up there. These two have, have ones that are copied out of the Benjamin book, which are sort of a symbolic fish, anyway. But um, anyhow, so we put this together, fixed the bad parts, lifted it up with the crane again, had bed timbers made, and when we got that up into there, we could not get the bed timbers into the space. I didn't have to go back to a pile of blocks. I just had to take them out again, cut them shorter. It was just a, something about the way how big the parts were made it difficult to get things that were of a certain length in through the, through the sides of the openings that were available. That's what happened to poor Lovell Kelton. Um, now, Lovell Kelton, and this I'm not going to blame him for, he worked on a bridge in 1804 that crossed the river from Brattleboro to Hinsdale, New Hampshire. The bridge was not designed by him. It was designed by someone named Kingsley. It was represented as one of the great wonders of the modern world in the northeastern United States and it fell down the next year. But they claimed, <laughs> they claimed that it fell down from weight of snow on it, which is possible, but it shouldn't happen. You generally, wooden bridges, their dead weight is alone. The weight of the is, is as great as the load you can get on it. Um, but anyhow, so, so Kelton, I don't know, if he, I, hopefully he didn't get blamed. I'm sure he was just doing what he was told to do by the designer of the bridge. And a lot of bridges are falling down. And he did rebuild Pardon me? I think he did rebuild it as well. So well, I heard... Like he wasn't blamed for it. Yeah, well, <laughs> actually, yeah, the odd thing, that was 1803, 1805. And then in the article I read, they talked from his diary of him going down there again in 1822, or 1820, yeah, 1822 to work on a bridge, or 1820. So I can't, maybe they didn't, they think they left the bridge that long before they had a bridge again? I don't know. What do you know about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, from his diaries. Okay. That's, that's, you know, that he had gone back down. I didn't remember it was that much later. Yeah, when I give a talk, by the way, I would love to know what anybody knows. Because <laughs> I don't know everything about these. I just visit these churches once in a while. But now you've got this building. But like I say, Kelton's a great framer. These, play, these things are very straight. They're very square. They're in great condition at their advanced age. He did a funny thing in this building. He broke a 4,500-year-old rule. No one, almost no one has ever broken this rule. The first time I came in this building, 35 years ago, I looked at these columns up the center here. I said, what the hell? Whoever does that? Almost no one. Columns should be, there should be four columns, or two columns, or no columns. Almost all the churches, and I, I go in a lot of churches, almost all the churches of the, starting in, well, even in Notre Dame, you might say that's being worked on right now, there are trusses, though they're not, they might, they're better called roof frames. Um, most of the churches, in New England, most of the churches in England, starting about 1600, are trust. That is, you don't need these columns. You don't need any columns inside. You can span 40, 50. Castleton spans 60 feet. New England, New Haven Green spans almost 80 feet with the truss. Bridges are trusses. They span one, two, 300 feet without any posts holding them up. The builder's guides are full of information about trusses because they aren't intuitive to everybody. This church is the only one I've ever been in in New England where a span this great is not trussed. And instead, it's quite the opposite of trussing. In a truss, you have a tie beam, you have a couple rafters, usually you usually have a king post or a queen post. And it's, there, that's, that's the old West Church truss. And there, he's... Um, barely trussing. He's trussing the middle 24 feet. It's not a very good truss. 
because it does bring some load down onto the tie beam from the struts. But um, that's the attic of this church right here. You've got the roof, you've got a very heavy roof, a very powerful roof, and he's got struts that take the load from the middle of the roof, deliver them right there to a 43 foot beam. That's nine by 10, something like that. He can't take it. They'd be deflected a foot by now. So he put these things in. And that they work fine. And there probably was one right there, right in the minister's face. <laughs> but he probably objected to it. And so what they did, if you go upstairs, Tom and I saw this the other day, there's a tremendous timber that starts back at the wall between those two columns back there. It runs back all the way to this column here, picks up the tie beam there, so you can get rid of this post. Whether it ever was there, I'm looking at a pretty old floor here, and I don't see any, any hole in it. Maybe they figured it out before they built the floor that they had to get rid of this column. But before I came here today, I said, if I'm going to claim 4,500 years, I better go online and look up ancient Egyptian temples. And yeah, they all knew it then too. Um, that you got your door, you got a couple columns here. You don't put columns in the middle of things. So it's a very odd feature. I know we all love this building, but it's a, it's a very unusual thing. I think Lovell Kelton didn't understand trusting very well. Like I say, at the old West Church, he got around the problem. He's got galleries. And um, you go back to that... Yeah, then you have gallery posts, then you have posts rising f through the above the gallery to the tie beams above, so he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to trust 44 feet. He only has to trust 20, 24 feet. And go to the picture of the truss if you can get it again, Dave. Um, there, that's the truss in the Old West. And in the middle, the posts on the... The vertical posts toward the outside, they actually form a sort of queen post truss that holds up a king post in the middle, which picks up the middle of the, of the tie beam, but the king post is also supported by undersized members that run down to the feet of those columns, and then it has those two shorter members that, if you're unlucky, put load in the middle of the tie beam again. Now, he's not the only person that did this. I took the tower out of the... Uh, Grand Dog County, the uh, Grand Dog County Courthouse one time. And they had the same thing. They had ancient trusses, trusses up there that were archaic in style. Each one of them had three sets of braces coming down. Two of them went to the right place. Two of them brought load down to the tie beam. It was just, uh, but they were, everything was so beefy, it didn't matter. But um, in the truth of the matter, you could get away with a lot with the quality of the timber, quality and size of the timber that was available in those days. But, um, and yeah, he seemed to have a, he had a good handle on the telescoping of steeples, though, and then he had beautiful proportioning. And um, why he didn't have a handle on trusses, I'm not sure. But, you know. Where is it likely the wood came from for the trusses? Oh, just nearby. Okay. In fact, uh, that's one of the, uh, that was a talk by a guy named John McNamara from upstate New York, who I know. He was showing pictures of a barn one time, and he said, you got to understand, these people were attempting to build beautiful things that would last forever out uh, of things they found within a quarter mile of their house. And uh, that's the wood and the stones. And I think, but the stone foundations are among the better things in these churches. It says, people have such a tendency to want to replace dry stone with concrete. For what reason? I don't know. Some people think it looks better. Um, any other questions about the framing of these churches? I could go on forever, but I'm not going to. But other people are going to talk. I'm going to speak. David, you're going to speak. Okay. Um, I think. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think we're going to hear from Tom Schmidt next because Tom is just going to fill in with a little something about the old meeting house. I'm going to do the same for the old West Church, and that will wrap this up. But we will all be here for questions and answers. You can just talk casually while we enjoy the wonderful refreshments that the arts ministry has put out in the night. Tom Schmidt, the author of 
this brand new book about the old meeting house, and it is fabulous. I, I always feel a little awkward, like I'm hawking my wares here, but I, I, there's nothing in this for me except the incredible fame and power that I, I get as a result. And there's nothing in it for the church either. This, the, the $25 is just to cover the cost of printing. So I'm going to abbreviate even further than my already abbreviated plan by just suggesting that many of you who know me and have read the book, I wouldn't have said anything new <laughs> this evening. And for those of you who don't know me or haven't read the book, well, now you better buy it because I'm not going to say anything. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I think it would be better for us to have a kind of a QA session. Although the Old West Church has gotten short shrift and I think it would behoove you to say something to kind of even the score a bit. Do you want to sign it? So, no, no. Here, uh, Tom and I were fully prepared to keep this to a certain length of time. But that does not mean that you can't talk to all of us, candidly, Nancy, Jan, and others who are here. In fact, we see many of the people who have been central to these two meeting houses right here in the audience. Many of you are the experts about these two churches. And I think the other big message that we have is that as these two churches celebrated their bicentennials right now, because uh, this church started in 1822, and it wasn't finished until 1825. Old West began in 1823 and was not finished until 1825. The mystery is that both of them elected to choose the date 1823 as their date when most people would assign the date to the completion of those churches. So they both should be 1825, with all due respect, but they both did this, independent of one another, yet another mystery. Um, why 1823? It's out on the signs of both churches and has been for decades, at least. So the other thing that happened in this church was that we had a very robust bicentennial committee chaired by Tom. And that committee not only produced this fabulous tome that he devoted great amount of his life to, um, but we also had researchers like Nathan Phillips and um, uh, Judy Granger. Judy is the one who connected the picture that Nancy showed um, of the interior of the meeting house over in the Connecticut River Valley in Mont Vernon, New Hampshire, uh, Rebecca Peabody Davis's home. And we believe she was the connection to why this church took the form that it did at the exact same time that Lovell Kelton was building something completely different in Catalyst. In Catalyst, Weston Kate and other historians thought that the people of Catalyst, since they largely came from the community of Charlton, Massachusetts, <laughs> must have a church there that caused Old West to look the way that it did. And yet, um, that church, it turned out, had been built after Old West. <laughs> so it could not have been the inspiration for Old West. And Westgate suggests that Caleb Curtis, one of Callis's founders, came from Salisbury, Connecticut, where there may have been a church that inspired the design of that church. And so, I see many of my collation friends here, 
I think we all need to go on a little field trip to Salisbury, yes. Connecticut, yes. and find the antecedent to the Old West Church so that we can do what the Meeting House has now done, which is to find our founding inspiration. Absolutely. And that is only one thing that might happen as research continues into understanding these wonderful buildings. If you find a copy of Herbert Wheaton Condon, uh, who, who photographed numerous historic buildings in Vermont in the 1930s, you will see both of these meeting houses called out as pristine examples of preservation. Old, and in the 1930s, these were buildings that were essentially very little used, which is essentially why they are so remarkably well preserved today. Both this church, which had a resurgence as a church in the 1960s, and Old West, which continues to simply be a community resource without a congregation, and that is to its advantage because nobody insisted that it have electric lights, <laughs> laptop computers, etc. In other words, we would be challenged to give this presentation at the Old West Church, uh, but we can here. We love these buildings, and we need to do everything we can to ensure that we understand them and that we continue to preserve them as best we can. David, can yes. you still appeal your rights go on this field trip, or do you have to be from Cal's? We, we will open this to anyone who is willing to go to Salisbury, Connecticut. I See me if you want to be part of this expedition. I also want to call out Susanna Blatchley, who is on the Callis Historic Preservation Commission and a trustee of the Old West Church, um, as a person with Tobin Anderson, who is putting together a Callis history tour. And we're, in particular, we need the, the stories to be true. And uh, we've been talking, for example, about the famous episode of the Millerites, who went into the Old West Church uh, December 31st, 1843, expecting the end of the world to come, and it didn't. They sheepishly emerged from the Old West Church, having given up all their worldly possessions, and were the first major homeless population <laughs> in Dallas for at least a while um, until they moved on uh, to other communities, possibly. Um, these are stories that it turns out may be nothing but stories. And that's part of the work that uh, Tobin and Susanna have been doing uh, to nail down the truth. And we're going to try to have an entertaining history tour, but one that hopefully will also be uh, truthful. So let's enjoy the refreshments. Talk to whoever you want to. Thank you so much for coming tonight. There are cookies.